Good morning. We're getting started on our hymn study. Uh, so this is Learn from the Hymns, and today we are looking at uh, a really well-known hymn. Uh, uh, it is well with my soul, or you may know it as the opening line, When peace like a river attendeth my soul. Uh, it's a beautiful hymn that we've we've most of us have sung for years without realizing the story behind it. Or maybe some of you know the story behind it. It was written by a man who experienced great personal tragedy and loss. Um, but even in the midst of his pain and grief, he was able to praise God for his goodness. Uh, so this, this great hymn encourages our souls to praise our gracious God, whatever our circumstances. Uh, so the story behind it, just to give you the, uh, a little bit of the background, is it's written by a guy named Horatio Spafford. Uh, he grew up um, in the Chicago area. He was a, a real estate investor. and um, where, But where he wrote this hymn was on a ship on the Atlantic Ocean. Um, it was in December, and as he was, as the ship was sailing along, he was shivering, not from the cold, but because of what had happened. Um, the, the captain of the ship had just told him, I believe we are now passing over the place where the Ville du Havre went down. And Sp Spafford shuddered because the Ville du Havre had carried precious cargo, his own family, just a week earlier. Uh, so he was born actually here in New York, in North Troy, New York, in 1828. He became a successful lawyer in Chicago. He was a friend of D.L. Moody and other evangelical leaders of the time. Uh, so he got really involved in Christian activities. He was described as a man of unusual intelligence and refinement, deeply spiritual, and a devoted student of the scriptures. Uh, but he went through a lot of hardship in his life. Um, First of all, uh, he went through the Chicago Fire in 1871, that, that huge fire that um, most of his real estate holdings were wiped out along with mo much of the city. Uh, and so two years later, in 1873, Spafford decided that his family needed a vacation and so planned a, a trip to Europe hoping actually to meet up with Moody, who was leading crusades in Great Britain. At the last minute, Spafford was detained by business matters, but he sent his wife, Anna, and their four daughters on ahead. On November 22nd, their ship, the Ville du Havre, was struck by another ship, the Locairn, and sank in 12 minutes. A few days later, when the survivors had arrived in Cardiff, Wales, his wife sent him a telegram saying, saved alone. Mm -hmm. Their four daughters, Maggie, Tanetta, Annie, and Bessie had not survived. Mm -hmm. So Spafford left as quickly as he could to join his wife. He um, shortly after his ship passed over the area where his daughters had drowned, he penned the words to this famous hymn. Uh, Even when his soul ached with sorrows like sea billows, he concentrated on God's peace, salvation, promise of heaven, so that he could sing, It is well with my soul. Um, later on, the Spaffords were blessed with three more children. Um, tragedy continued to follow them, however, because their son died of scarlet fever at the age of four. Uh, in 1881, Spafford and his family left Chicago to move to Jerusalem, establishing the American colony to uh, care for the sick and the destitute. And he died in 1888 of malaria. Uh, though Sp Spafford's life was full of tragedy, he wrote one of the most beloved hymns of trust in God's goodness. <laughs> So let's sing um, the first two, some, two verses of It Is Well With My Soul. When peace like a river 
sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, the rest of me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Oh, Satan should not it, no trial shall come. Let this past assurance control that Christ has regard in my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. Uh, uh, Tim, did you have any? Uh, yeah, well, a little bit. Nothing, well, nothing too crazy. Um, so the the tune itself was written by Phil uh, Peavy Bliss, and I have some notes from uh, here. So he lived around the same time. Uh, he was born in Clearfield County, Pennsylvania, uh, and he used to be a farmer as well. And uh, oddly enough, just like our guy from last week, he also went to Chicago to do gospel music. Uh, and uh, revival worship music at the time. And uh, he had a pretty short life. He only lived to be about 38, because uh, also there's a lot of despair in these guys. Uh, he died in a train accident mm. in Ashtabula, Ohio, uh, while he was commuting. So that's, oh. the, that, that's pretty much what I have for that. I don't have anything like crazy insightful about when peace like a river the only thing is like well in this key i just have to worry about playing the black keys really so that, that's pretty much uh that's pretty much my insight uh so not very unfortunately not very deep besides uh, that's all right just strategy behind yeah. this music right you know? right yeah um it's really amazing how god can speak to us sometimes most strongly when we're going through despair and tragedy and loss um, drives us to our knees. Uh, how is it possible to, to say it is well with my soul when you're going through tragedy in your life? Yeah. When my husband passed, this song was very meaningful to me mm. because mentally and physically I was devastated, but yeah. I kept saying it's well with my soul mm. because I knew where my husband was. Mm. Yeah. So you had that peace, yes. even in the midst of the pain of losing your husband, that you knew where he was, yeah. you know, that, that he was there. with Jesus, that this wasn't the, the end of yeah. the chapter. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. What other thoughts do you have about um, how you can overcome life's difficulties because of, because of Jesus? Yeah. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Mm. Mm hmm Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I'm just going to go again, but he's got my soul. Yeah, yeah. So knowing those Bible stories of Jonah being swallowed by a whale and um, the, the men who went through the fire, you know, thrown into the fire, and yet they survived because someone was with them who looked like a son of the gods, <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar thought, who else would that be? <laughs> but Jesus himself, you know, long before he was born, but walking with them in the fire. Yeah. 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 What was it, Dorothy? Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Yeah. His mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And that's another great hymn. So, yeah. Yes, story of Job. Right, yeah. 
all in one day. I mean, what all did he lose in one day? Yeah. He lost all four of his children. Yeah. All of his donkeys mm -hmm. and the people who worked them. Right. Yeah, in one day. All of his cattle, all mm -hmm. his sheep. Mm-hmm. So he was this rich guy. He had all these flocks of and herds of sheep and goats and cattle, you know, all these servants taking care of them. And in one day, they were destroyed by uh, raiding bands and by fire from heaven. And then all of his kids were in the, you know, having a party, feasting together in one of in one of their houses. And this huge wind came and knocked it flat. And they were all killed. And every one of these tragedies all happened on the same day. And, you know, a servant from each place ran up to Job and said, I'm the only one left to tell you what happened. And all of these things happened. And what was Job's response? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He didn't shake his fist. He didn't get angry. He just accepted it. Now, you know, so so we call that like the patience of Job. I don't think I would have been that. <laughs> yeah, what, what were you going to say? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, right. No matter what the devil throws at us. It's temporary. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the, that wasn't the end. I mean, that was all one day. And then, you know, shortly afterwards, he was covered in sores from head to foot. Couldn't get any relief. All he could do is take a piece of broken pottery and scrape himself. <laughs> um, and he was sitting in ashes. And then his friends came to visit. You know, yeah, and and for for a whole week, they just sat with him in silence because they saw how great his suffering was. That was the best thing that they did. Just sat with him because as soon as they opened their mouths, <laughs> they started blaming him. You know, back then they had this idea that you know, if something bad happened to you, you earned it. You must have done something to tick God off <laughs> to deserve all this suffering. And, and you know, people still have that idea today. The whole idea of karma, you know, you get what's coming to you, you know, whether it's in this life or the next, you know, uh, that's, that stills out there and in people's heads that, oh, God must be really mad at me. But that's not what the gospel is. You know? um, the gospel is that God is with us in the midst of all of our pain and suffering. Um, but it's hard sometimes to believe that God is good when we're going through heartbreak, you know, when, when we're facing incredible loss, like, like Spafford. Um, you know, so that, that first line um, is, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. And, and he wrote that right as his ship was passing over the spot. You know, the, the billows, the waves of the sea were going over the very spot where his daughters had gone down. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Um, we all experience hardship and heartache. You know, we may not all have lost all of our children in tragic accident, but most of us have faced the loss of a loved one. Um, we may not have lost all of our businesses to a citywide fire, but we've had financial setbacks. We struggle with prod problems, with adversities. Sometimes we're able to respond in trust, but often it's difficult to hang on to that thread of 
hope. And it's much easier to just ask, why me? Why this? Why now? You know, we're filled with all these why questions. Yeah, and why not this instead? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because suffering is, is part of our fallen human condition. No, I, it's, I like the fact too that it says it, thou has taught me to say how mm -hmm. how could you say it is well with my soul? Yeah. The Bible. He, he, the he, only way that you can say that <laughs> is if you're rooted in scripture, if yeah. you're rooted in hope, if you have that perspective of this isn't the last word for me and for my family. Um, yeah. Um, there's when we're going through those times. <laughs> Uh, those difficult, hard, hard times, the only thing we can do is lean on our Lord and and take comfort in the stories of other people who have gone before us and gone through this sort of stuff too. You know, whether it's Job, whether it's um, Solomon, whether it's David, um, anyone in scripture who has gone through incredible loss, Mary, you know, seeing her own son put up on a cross. You know, the, when they first brought baby Jesus to the temple, you know, the, the um, prophet Simeon, Simeon, this old guy was there, and uh, Anna, um, who was a prophetess, said to her, a sword, you know, is going to pierce your own soul too. Even though they were recognizing this is the savior of the world. This is the one through whom God is going to fulfill all of his promises. It's still going to mean heartache for you. It's going to be like a sword going through you. Um, the people of the Bible... <laughs> are not these heroes of faith who have always, you know, never wavered in their, in their trust. Um, it's just not the case. Um, yeah, we've already talked about Job, um, but he, he had his moments of despair. You know, af after his friends started blaming him, or actually even before that, he cried out, um, he cursed the day of his birth. He wouldn't curse God, but he cursed the day of his birth. He's like, why was I even born? Why didn't I just die at birth instead of having to go through all of this? Um, and David, you know, in Psalm 31, um, you can see his honesty with God when he says, my life is consumed by anguish and my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my afflictions and my bones grow weak. And all the prophets, <laughs> so many of the prophets were trying to warn the people about what was coming if they didn't turn away from their sin and from their neglect of the poor and their injustice. Uh, and like Habakkuk <laughs> cried out, how long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you don't listen? So how did these, these faithful people get beyond their despair? What helped them? The peace of God which passes all understanding. Mm, yeah, yeah, the peace of God which passes understanding. Uh, a lot of people think, you know, peace is what you experience when everything is going your way. But there's a way deeper peace that we can experience even when things are not going our way. Look at Daniel 7, verse 7, it says, Please sign, you will keep them in perfect peace. It's my understanding. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. Of course, uh, he doesn't change the event that took place, but uh, in spite of the end, in spite of our frailties, uh, he, he provides that it isn't we do something. Yeah, yeah, I love that. So Isaiah 27. 
somewhere in there, but it's, it's, mm -hmm. you will keep in perfect peace. He whose mind is stayed on you when you're, when you're, when your heart and your mind are stayed on him, he keeps us in peace. Yeah. Um, um, also in, in Psalm 31, David says, I, I, tr even though he was weak from sorrow and groaning, he still held on to hope. He said, I trust you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Um, and that was true for Job too. Even though he went through all this suffering, although even though he lost everything and then had all these sores on him and had his friends turn against him, uh, he still hung on to hope. Every time that we have a funeral, one of the readings that we have when we go to the cemetery, as we're putting this loved one in the ground, we read Job's words right in the middle of his suffering. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives. And even though I should die, even though my flesh should decay yet still from my flesh i will see god he would trust even back in the old testament in resurrection that god wasn't going to let death have the last word um, let's take a look at psalm 42. if you got your bibles you can open to that Um, Sarah, would you mind reading the psalm to us? Sure. Psalm 42. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts of, with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. <laughs> I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So, what did you hear in that psalm? Um, what, what were... The things that the the writer was um, feeling heavy about, what was weighing down on him. How does he describe um, his feelings in this in this song? He misses the feeling that he had when he was joyful on the way going to the temple. Yeah, yeah. So he re he remembers. Oh, it used to be so much fun to go to the temple and all these people singing praise and you know celebrating together. I'm not feeling that right now. Why is that? Well, 
Like look at verse seven. Or the, the end of, of verse uh, six or, or verse six and seven. What what do you see there about how he's feeling? What does he say about his soul? Cast down. Yeah, my soul is cast down within me. Um, all of you know, uh, your breakers and your waves have gone over me. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. It's like he's standing at the base of Niagara Falls and just getting drowned in uh, in this pain. Um, verse 9, he says, Why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? It says, it's like I've got this deadly wound in my bones. My adversaries are taunting me. All day long they say, where is your God? And my soul is cast down and is in turmoil within me. But what's the very end of the psalm? What's the very last thing that he says? Yeah. Hope. Mm -hmm. Put your hope in God. Why are you cast down, O my soul? I shall again praise him, my Savior, my salvation, and my God. Uh, so he says that twice, you know, verse 5 and verse 11. It's like he's talking to himself. <laughs> Why are you cast down? Put your hope in God. He's your Savior. He's going to rescue you. Um, Interesting. He talks about the sea billows. And yeah. that's the word that's used in this Bible. Also. Right. Yep. So yep. He, must, he might have used this. It, it really this. echoes the song, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Let's read the second verse together. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. So the stuff that went, that Spafford went through was certainly intense. You know, losing all of his livelihood, his real estate, um, and then losing his daughters, and you know, then losing a son, uh, a newborn son. Uh, he... He went through a lot of suffering in his life, um, even though he was known for his faith and for his service to others. Um, we, we always ask that question, why do bad things happen to good people? And there's no easy answer for that. We know it's, it's part of our existence <laughs> uh, ever since Adam and Eve. Um, they were thrown out of paradise. They were told to expect pain, and hard work, and death. Um, but Jesus didn't seem to think that the problems that we face were all that unusual. He, he even told his disciples, in this world you will have trouble. You will face persecution. But do not fear. I have overcome the world. Because Jesus shed his own blood for my soul, as the song says, he conquered the world and Satan and death. We still go through trials, but they don't have to defeat us because we have an unshakable hope. In his first letter, John tells us, everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. That word for victory in Greek is the word Nike, which is where Nike, Nike gets its word, uh, its name. <laughs> victory, yeah. You put these shoes on and you will be victorious. <laughs> uh, it, it means to overcome, to conquer, to subdue. 
absolute victory is what it means. Uh, and that's what we have in Christ. Um, complete victory over the world and Satan. The devil's going to use everything in his arsenal against us. Uh, pain, crises, loss, to try and defeat us, overwhelm us, crush us. Um, he'll use anything that he can to try and pull us out of Christ's grasp. But with the Holy Spirit's help, we can hang on through any tragedy. And triumph on the other side. Let's let's turn now to Romans chapter 8. This is one of my favorite parts of scripture. Uh, so certainly one of my favorite parts of um, this this letter of Rome uh, of Paul's in Romans and he, he's talking about the suffering that we go through, the heartache that we experience in this life. Um, but that God helps us in the midst of our weakness. Um, um, Sarah, you want to read verses 31 through 39? Sure. The end of it, sir. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also be with him graciously, also with him graciously give us all things. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So what do you hear Paul saying in those verses about how we can be victorious over life's difficulties? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that we can lean on him, that uh, no matter what we're going through, that he's with us. What else? Just that absolutely nothing, past, present, or future, can ever separate us from God. That's right. Nothing can separate us from God's love. And he lists off all these different things of, of uh, neither death nor life, angels or rulers, things present, things to come, powers, height, depth, nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Have there been a have, has there been a time that you can think of when you've gone through a, a crisis or a tragedy and powerfully felt God's love in the midst of that? Anybody have something that they want to share about it? What'd you say? It's still with with my soul. Yeah, yeah. That you can feel. <laughs> Like he's saying, it is well with my soul, even in the midst of, of difficulty. I can't think of anything specific, but if you focus on him as opposed to what's happening around you, just right. focus on him. Yeah, yeah. That's where you get it's to so see. easy to just get just mired in our own feelings, our own, our emotions, the, the circumstances that we're going through, the pain that we're experiencing. But when we turn our eyes up, even just, even just asking, where are you, God? You know, 
he'll reach out to us, walk right alongside us, be there with us through it. I, when I've been in some low points, I've, I, I have felt like physically like held down by it. Like mm. just mm -hmm. like I couldn't, my just pin down is the only way I can say it. And then something changes and the Holy Spirit gives this tiny glimmer of hope. Mm, and it's mm. it's that hope that that turns things around. Yeah. And it's it's never because of any idea that I came up with on my own or found my you know my way out myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's just that feeling that things might change and get better, and I know that that's from the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah, it's the Holy Spirit, like uh, like Paul talks about earlier in this chapter. Um, he says that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. When we're at our lowest point, the Holy Spirit uh, intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. Uh, even when we don't know what to pray or how to pray, the Spirit can speak through that. Right. Yeah. Wait on the Lord. Yep. Um, that's that's all we can do sometimes. Is wait on him trust that whatever we're going through isn't going to last but that god's it peace well god's strength soul. yeah then you can say it is well with my soul it, that that has to be the work of the holy spirit nobody there's no way that you could write that this guy could write that as he was going across except for he knew who Jesus was and what Jesus had done for him. Let's read that third verse. Because uh, this, this points to how Jesus has met our greatest need. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. You remember the, the story of the paralyzed guy on the mat uh, who had four friends who were carrying him, and they wanted to bring him to Jesus because they had heard about Jesus healing people. And they thought, even our friend who's paralyzed, if we could just get him to Jesus. But they came into town, and the crowds were so huge that the house where Jesus was in was completely packed full of people. And they were spilling out into the streets. They couldn't get inside the house with their friend. So what did they do? They went up on the roof. <laughs> they didn't have a skylight up there. <laughs> you know, they typically flat roofs in the Middle East. And it was, you know... Uh, They'd have timbers, and then they'd have thatch, and then they'd have mud, you know, all on top. And so they actually dug a hole through the roof with their hands or whatever they could find. You can just imagine Jesus is sitting here teaching people, and all of a sudden, here's all this stuff coming down from the ceiling. They're, what on earth? People's getting out of the way. And then here comes this guy being lowered on ropes down to Jesus right in front of him. And the and Jesus looks at the guy, he looks at the guys up in the up in the rafters, and he looks at the guy and loves him and says, My son, your sins are forgiven. He dealt with the most pressing need. And then he went on to heal him. <laughs> but first he addressed his most important need, his need for forgiveness. Um, I mean, he, absolutely, absolutely. He was 
He looked at the faith of his friends. Right yep, yep. And, you know, and, and of course, the, there were some religious leaders there. And they were like this. <laughs> <laughs> Who can forgive sins except God alone? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, the homeowner, too. It's like, ah! <laughs> But just think of his wife. Clean this yeah. up. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> yep. But in the middle of all of that, you know, Jesus spoke to the guy's greatest need. Uh, and then when the religious leaders made a fuss, you know, and said, Who can forgive sins but God? Jesus said, Well. I want you to know that the Son of Man has the authority to do that. What's easier? To say, your sins are forgiven. Or to say, pick up your mat and walk. So you know who I am and that I have this authority to forgive. Pick up your mat, walk home. And he did it. <laughs> got up, rolled up his mat, mat, and walked out through the crowd. But just like Jesus first attended to the guy's greater need for forgiveness, that was on Spafford's mind, too. Um, he, Even though he had gone through great tragedy, he was still able to rejoice because his most important problem in already been solved on the cross. His sin was forgiven. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yep. He would still have to learn how to live without his four precious daughters. Um, but he didn't have to live with his burden of sin. He didn't have to, um, you know, he, he could... Because of what Jesus did on the cross, he could say, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, even in his dark hours of sorrow, because our, our heaviest burden has been lifted. Uh, let me look at that last verse already yeah oh, okay let's let's go on last verse read it together and lord haste the day when my faith shall be sight the clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump shall resound and the lord shall descend even so it is well with my soul and in in romans paul writes um a, a, a little bit earlier in chapter 8, you know, he's, he's talking about all the things that we have gone through, all the pain that we experience, how even, even creation itself seems to be groaning in labor pains, uh, waiting for God's children to be revealed. And so... In verse 18, Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. The creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. You know, and, and he holds out this hope that all of creation is going to be set free. Uh, from its bondage to corruption, decay, and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So, even in our suffering, we can look ahead to the glory that's going to be revealed to us and in us. Uh, Spafford knew 
financial loss, personal tragedy, profound grief. Uh, and yet in the midst of his heartache, he could affirm that his spirit was sound and safe in the promises of his Lord. He clung to the goodness of God. And he looked ahead to the day when everything will be made new. And that's what we're celebrating in Advent, not only looking forward to the arrival of Christmas and all the joy that the Christmas season brings and the promise of Jesus being born, but we're also looking forward to when Jesus returns and makes everything new and restores all things. You know, and that's that's how he closes this hymn is with, you know, Lord, haste the day. Let that day come when faith will be sight, you know, that it won't be just looking forward to something down the road, but it's here. He's here. Everything is new. The There's Lord a lot shall descend. Action in that last verse, isn't it? Yeah. The clouds yeah. are going to be rolled back. The mm -hmm. trumpet will sound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Lord will descend. Yeah. That's it's really everything out of <laughs> Revelation 21 and 22. Yeah. Uh, the, the end is really a whole new beginning. I think you are experiencing all over the world too, not just in Jerusalem. That's right. That's right. Yeah. His coming will be like the lightning flashing from the east to the west. <laughs> uh, and, you know, nowadays, we know that the world isn't flat. <laughs> the east is all the way around. The west is all the way around. Uh, yeah, so this this hymn can really be kind of like a lesson plan of how to endure suffering how to hold on to hope even in the midst of tragedy. Because in Jesus, in his victory, we can overcome any test. A lot of people think that, you know, that are kind of on the outside of Christianity think that, oh, it must mean that, you know, everything's great all the time and, <laughs> and, how, that's not real, but yeah. that's not what it's about. It's having that security and that promise and that, you know, hope alongside whatever we're going through mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. life. It's not either or. Yeah. Being Christian doesn't mean that everything is smooth sailing. You know, Jesus promised exactly the opposite. <laughs> you're, you're going to have persecution you're going to have trouble in this world you know he told his disciples straight out you're going to be persecuted you're going to be thrown in prison you're going to be tortured some of you are going to die most of them died for their faith in christ but do not fear i've overcome the world even death can't separate you from me So, to close it out, I'm um, going to have us listen to a more modern version of this song um, by Chris Rice. Uh, you can find this on YouTube uh, just by looking up It Is Well With My Soul and Chris Rice. Uh, we're going to uh, play it for you here. But those of you who, who watch this recording later online, um, just go to YouTube to find that particular um, song. 